thank you to Roslyn Sustainability Committee for inviting me back to do this as part of Earth Day. What an honor to uh, to be here on this uh, amazing, uh, I don't know if we call it a holiday, but this uh, annual event that we call Earth Day. And uh, I just saw Lisa there uh, acknowledging uh, Sanaiks and Silsh and Swetmuk and uh, probably Tanaha, uh, all the, the territories here, for those of you who don't know the West Kootenai territories of all of those, of those peoples, the unceded ancestral lands of those peoples, I'd like to acknowledge, especially Roslyn and the traditional territory of the Sanaiks. And I'm just really, I wanna say honored and privileged to live and work um, on these um, ancestral lands. And really learn from the plants and the ecosystems that have been tended and stewarded and loved um, and looked after by indigenous peoples for thousands and thousands of years. And so I do my best as a settler to carry on um, those traditions of, of caring from them and learning and learning from those plants. So thank you. And let's get into this. I'm super excited to be here. I have a lot to go through. Um, Kaylee, you mentioned the word strategies. That's kind of where I was going with this. So I have kind of different things to present. Um, so I hope I will at least speak to each and every one of you in, in your own way um, that makes sense to you. So let's get started. Sure. Kaylee, is that good? Looks great. Okay. So yeah, I, I took on a, a bit of a provocative title here, Blurring the Fence, Native Plants in Our Gardens. And I hope this will become uh, a little clearer as we, we go along. Uh, so let's get at it. So the talk tonight, um, I, I ran into a, a Roslander a couple of days ago, Mel, and, and she was letting me know that, you know, maybe it's just some basic native plant 101 might be a good way to start. So we'll start with that and just kind of make sure everybody's on the same page or in this case screen. Um, and then we're going to go into something that I came up with called the bees approach. And what that stands for is begin educate, explore, and share. And that is a great way to keep, I think, motivated, inspired, um, support each other, and push forward in, in learning how to do native plant gardening and propagation and, and, and work with native plants. So we'll cover off of that. In each one of those, I'm going to provide some kind of introduction, talk about you know, what do I mean by begin or educate, that sort of thing. I'm going to highlight a project that I've been involved with, either with Kinseed uh, Ecologies or with the Kootenai Native Plant Society. Um, highlight a technique or techniques um, and go through that. So that's kind of the strategies part. Um, and then highlight some native plants because, you know, this is about native plants and Earth Day and, and also share some of my good friends with you. Um, and then we'll bring the bees to Roslyn, as they say, with a little schematic at the end that I hope will hope uh, kind of encapsulate it a little bit. All right. So about me, so I, we started, Valerie and I, Valerie Huff and I started Kinseed um, a few years ago uh, to bring ecotypic or truly native uh, seeds and plants to people in the West Kootenai. Since then, we've branched out to the East Kootenai and uh, Columbia Shushwap areas as well. Um, Valerie is a co-founder of the Kootenai Native Plant Society, and we continue to work um, with the Kootenai Native Plant Society and are thrilled to do so. So some of this work I'm presenting on behalf of Kinseed and some I'm presenting on the work with the Kootenai Native Plant Society. Um, so here, this is at our home in Nelson doing just a, a workshop right in our nursery, in our home nursery. Um, this is what it looks like when there's no snow um, and plants are coming up. Uh, here I do school programs every year um, in Millennium Park and in other places around the West Kootenai with kids. I love reaching out to the school kids and, and working with them, bringing native plants to them. And I just wanted to 
bring in this photo picture of us. This is a, a levee at Bummer's Flats in the East Kootenai. And so we're, we do restoration as well. And this is a, a large restoration project where we have been charged with uh, turning this old levee, which is about a kilometer long into a pollinator meadow. So stay tuned for that. We're just entering our second year of five. So that's pretty exciting. So yeah, I have my education from the University of Victoria. I got to work with mentor, uh, my mentor, Dr. Nancy Turner, um, and I taught at UVic for, oh gosh, many years before teaching at Silker College when I moved out here. And so, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be in this phase of my life and, and bringing this information to you as an, more of an environmental educator now. All right, Native Plants 101. Okay, so let's get to, what is a native plant, all right? Native plants really are described by where they live, right? You can't meaningfully say a plant is native without saying it where it's native to. Um, native plants and their native pollinators, they occur naturally all around you, right? If you look out your window right now, you're seeing probably hundreds of species of native plants, you don't even know it, but and fungi and lichens and mosses and, and many other organisms. In the ecoregion and habitat where over the course of evolutionary time, right, a long period of time, they have adapted uh, to environmental and climatic conditions and co-evolved with other species in the system. So that's really important there with native plants, there is tried and true co-evolved relationships, connections, interconnections there. Um, that these insects, uh, in this case, pollinators, bees, butterflies, that sort of thing, don't have with horticultural species, right? So by bringing those native plants in, you're boostering ecological resilience across the landscape, right? Because we've taken it away by putting in our, our roads and our schools and our parks and our cities, right? And so it's kind of putting back in to reestablish those linkages that are really, really important, okay? The many virtues of native plants. I, I go back and forth. I'm like, I think they have intrinsic value and that's enough, but I know other people want to know more. So this is the more part. Where they grow, native plants maintain ecological integrity and health, right? They function on a very fundamental foundational level um, to maintain resilience, ecological integrity and health contribute to climate adaptation. They respond to climate, but they help mitigate local, regional climate as well. And have supported and inspired people for thousands of years. When they are in your yard, native plants can contribute to water conservation, right? That's a pretty good thing. They can be both fire smart, climate smart, water smart, and just pretty good idea. I mean, think about it, you could, thin those trees, you could open up some gaps, you could get some herbaceous species in there that are green, that are wet in the summertime, mitigate fire danger, bring it right down. Climate smart, work with a species that like it, warmer, drier, that can withstand where our climate is bound to end up here in the Kootenays, right? Often, I put it in parentheses, often, be maintained with less inputs. Not always, but a lot of time, you know, a lot of people say, oh, native plant gardening, low, low maintenance or no maintenance. No, no, no. All gardens require maintenance. Don't believe that they don't. They do. But sometimes they can require less input unless sometimes they can do a lot more with less than as opposed to horticultural species. They can enhance local biodiversity and species connections and they can support and inspire you for many years. All right, but you know, I have to talk about some challenges, all right? There are plenty, there are many. I mean, we get thrown at, especially around Earth Day, we get thrown, oh, put native plants in your garden or native plants in the schools or native plants. Yeah, that's all great, but mm, it's not actually really that easy to do that, right? They are very fundamentally different. They've been, they have evolved out there not you know in our in our yards so truly native plants right you can go get say kanikanik at the garden center but it's not native to here right it was grown somewhere else and brought in yes it's a species that occurs here 
but it's not native to here, right? So native plants are limited in selection and availability, so they're more expensive, right? So be prepared that if you want truly native plants, and there's lots of reasons why, as I just showed you, you're gonna pay a little bit more money. They're not horticultural plants that have been bred for predictable growth, continuous blooming, showy flowers or foliage. These are not wave petunias, people, no. Nor will they ever be. But that actually makes them really exciting and really unique too. Often take time to establish. Some take a long time to even germinate, right? Like two, three, five years. Some take long to um, mature, right? From seed to flowering, uh, say some of your bulb species, five years minimum, right? So you have to have some patience. Often difficult to propagate. They're, they're a bit different. Sometimes like berry, berries passing through the gut of a bear is exactly what they need. How are you gonna replicate that, right? Some need, um, cold moist stratification, right? Some need different preparations. So it's learning about what each plant needs that's specific to its own um, ecology. They follow their own rule book. And I've learned this a long, long time ago. You need to learn their rule book and uh, don't write your own. Yeah, but use theirs. Um, they'll teach you well. But look at this, British Columbia, the, my, those of you from, I believe, Denver, Colorado and New York, we have over 2000 native plants in British Columbia, over 40, 450 native bees, over 250 native butterflies. I mean, in terms of pollinators, that is just amazing, right? In Roslyn and West Kootenai alone, hundreds, hundreds of native plants probably well over 200 native bees or more, right? And just, we live in great diversity and we should celebrate that. And we should look to want to include that into our lives more so. I mean, what a, a wonderful opportunity that would be, right? To, to bring nature in. Okay, bees, remember? I can't hear you, so begin, educate, explore, share. All right, so where do you begin? All I'm saying about this first word is just start, try, right? It's not, it, it's gonna be tricky, yeah, and you're not gonna know a lot, and you're gonna fail sometimes, right, and make mistakes, but just try right, and work with the plants and let the plants teach you. Prepare a site no matter the size. You can do native plants in pots, some. You can do small patches, which I lovingly call habit patches. Um, even micro habitats can be habitats to support ecological diversity. If you have room to do more, do more, but I actually really recommend start small. Planting in, is fall for native species. Um, start with some easy growers. I have a couple to suggest for you here. Um, but that also means planning ahead. Like we think spring is the time for planting. Yeah, it can be. That's often when the garden centers say, hey, this is the time for planting. But really think about what happens out there in nature. When those seeds fall, everything's getting prepared. Those seeds are starting to kind of work their way in the soil and get ready for winter. That is when they're setting seed. That is when they're sowing themselves. So that's when we should also be doing that. And that's what we do in our nursery. Conventional gardens are typically divine by their limitations. So that's why I'm asking you to blur those fences, start breaking down, this is a metaphor, right? Start breaking down the boundaries and those limitations that you put on yourself in the conventional garden and say, hey, you know, I do like my, you know, my perennial bed over here. I'm gonna keep it as it is, but over here, I think I'm gonna try something a little bit different and that's okay, right? You can do a hybrid approach. We have a hybrid approach. And that's perfectly okay. You can start playing a little bit, but just try. Shift to seeing and working with opportunities. There's gonna be limitations. There always are in gardening. 
but there's also lots of great opportunities out there, especially when you're working as a community as well. And you can kind of riff off each other and feed off each other and, and support each other. Do what you can, but do something. All right. Find your own pace, right? Don't work on anyone else's. Find what you can do. And there are stages, levels that you can approach gardening in, right? You can simply garden. You can simply take one or two or three species and put them into your yard, see how they do, collect seed from them the next year, roll it out, right? That's perfectly okay. You could do something called naturescaping. Naturescaping has been around for a couple of decades or more. Um, and I, I use it to describe doing a little bit more, right? And creating a meadow. So taking that, instead of putting a few plants in, make a little community, right? Um, putting in a little grouping of plants. Um, start seeing multiple uses of values. Maybe do, putting in some plants that have ethnobotanical use. That's awesome, right? Or good habitat use, right? Think about that. So kind of stepping it up a little bit in terms of the uh, input. And then there's rewilding. And rewilding is where you can really start thinking about your yard in ecological terms, right? So build functioning ecosystems in your yard, uh, requires a little less let, letting go of control a little bit, lowering those fences, um, welcoming in connectivity, um, and also really committing yourself to buying locally sourced ecotypic or truly native plants because those are the best ones that have the genetic variability to support native pollinators and really create resilient habitat. All right, so this is the project in the section that I would like to highlight. It's actually a project that I'm doing, working with the Kootenai Native Plant Society in partnership with BC Parks. And I am thrilled to death to be a part of this. And I want you all to come and check it out. And if you wanna even volunteer to help out, that would be awesome too. So last year, there was a roundabout at Syringa Provincial Park in the group campground. Probably some of you have been there, I'm guessing. And it looked like this. But we are turning it into an interpretive garden, which is really exciting. So with a lot of work and help of uh, the lovely Amanda right here and excavator, not everybody has an excavator, but we got one that day. Um, we turned it into that. Okay, so this is what it looked like last fall. Now it's covered in black plastic, um, but it's going to be transformed this year. And it's gonna be transformed into something that looks like this. And it's super, super exciting, right? So a nice accessible walkway here. We planted showy milkweed here and some wildflower seeds. But this year we're gonna do something called solarization that I'm gonna describe. We're gonna do some sheet mulching, which I will also describe. And we're gonna put in, uh, we'll see how the showy milkweed comes up. And we're gonna also plant spreading dog bane. So why these two species? Just a minute on that. So many of you know showy milkweed. It's our only native milkweed. And so of course it attracts pollinators like this Western tiger swallowtail. It not only attracts a few pollinators like this butterfly, but many. It's a pollinator magnet. And of course it is the host species of the monarch, um, which is endangered. So plant milkweed, maybe we can get monarchs back into um, the West Kootenai region. The last time an adult monarch was seen here is 2015. However, we're planning it because it draws in and supports so many pollinators. It is ridiculous, right? So pollinator magnet. We didn't know that spreading dogbane was also a pollinator magnet until we were doing this research as part of this climate resilient butterfly research as part of the Kootenai Native Plant Society. So now we found out that not only does spreading dogbane attract all kinds of butterflies, but all kinds of bees too. So that's why these two areas are really gonna showcase those plants and it's gonna draw in so many wonderful native pollinators. So this is a super exciting. Um, project that's going on in BC parks. So a little bit more about solarization. So this is a little strategy, a technique that I was going to share with you. We've been doing this with 
a few folks right now. Um, Olga, I know you're on here, so I wanted to let you know these little pink fairies that I'm circling down here are coming up at the Kootenai Gallery, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but you should be thrilled that those are already coming up there at the Kootenai Gallery where we solarized last, just last year. So what is solarization and why am I using clear plastic? Well, clear plastic is the best for most sites. Um, you want to pull it taut kind of tuck those edges like you can see right in here, right? And you wanna get it on as early in the spring as you can, excuse me, and leave it on until late fall. Why you do clear and not black is because you wanna create an ultra greenhouse effect, right? You want that heat coming through, you want UV penetration, you want it to kick up that heat as much as you can. You wanna get those plants starting to respire and you want them then to worry and die because they don't have the space, they don't have the oxygen, they don't have the carbon dioxide, they don't have what they need to continue growing at the rate that they want to grow because they're in a greenhouse. And so it is a great way to kill the top vegetation layer. If you can get it hot enough, like last summer in the Kootenays with our heat dome, you can even kill some of the top seeds in the soil as well but you got to get it on and leave it on and keep it air tight, right? It works best on, this may not work well in Rosalind, I understand, works well on flat surfaces in full sun. So we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, a little bit more about that with the Kootenai Gallery coming up soon. I mentioned that you could start with some easy ones, easy plants to start, annuals, annual wildflowers. So the pink fairies I just mentioned, those little cute little plants, that's what these gorgeous plants are right there. Clarkia pochella. I mean, do you know any other species that has petals like that? Come on, right? And they're paired beautifully in our front yard here with the Grand Colomia, right? It just so happens that these beautiful orange flowers have blue pollen, pink fairies have pink pollen. So if you kind of get in close and a little intimate with your flowers, they have some pretty cool features, right? This one over here cool, uh, occurs in our riparian areas along the Pend Array and the Columbia and Kootenai rivers. This is uh, our native Coreopsis. So there are some, some names you're gonna recognize from the horticultural trade. We have the native variety right here. Why not put the native ones in, right? Look at how cool this is, right? This beautiful Coreopsis. I think this picture was taken down at um, Janelle. All right, so some annual native plants. Okay, so we started, now we're in it, right? We've begun it, we're starting it, we're hooked. All right, so now we gotta learn some stuff. So educate, build your native plant literacy. Attend events, hey, like an Earth Day event. That would be great. A talk or a native plant workshop like the one on Sunday, make sure you get over there in Roslyn. Um, online webinars such as this one. Learn your plants. Learn the, not just your plants, learn the ecology where you live, right? And so just, a note, right? So some people, like one of the, the questions I often get when I, I do a talk is, well, is that native plant an invasive plant? Eh, could be, right? So I just, I just wanna, you know, learn the ecology, right? And I, I challenge you to take that word invasive right out of your brain, right? Plants can be opportunistic, they can be aggressive. Plants occupy space. And some do it very well. And when they do it well, we call it invasive, right? Some pl plants are non-native or they're native. Some, both of them could be aggressive where you put them. So learn the ecology of your plants. You will know how best to deal with them or not deal with them at all, right? So just think about it that way. Think about not plants being good or bad or invasive or native or anything like that. A plant is a plant figure out what it is, where it wants to grow best, and does it work for you? Books, right? One of the best for the interior, of course, is you probably, I don't know if you can see it, right? The Plants of the Interior BC. Uh, many of the plants that I talk about in here 
are not in here, that's because we're so biologically diverse. So, but it's a good place to start. Um, I brought out some, a couple of other ones that might be, and I'll put these, if we do a follow-up email, like I can put a, a book list on there. So this is a, a good book, how to, bringing nature home, how, to, how you can sustain wildlife and native plants. 100 plants to feed the bees. Now we're talking about bees. So that's a good one. Okay, so lots of lots of really good books out there and I can, I can put together a, a book list for you. Of course, take heights and observe native plants around you. See what they're doing out there. If you have a yard that is, has similar ecological um, characteristics, maybe they do well for you too. Track plant phenology. So learn big kid words like phenology, which means timing of plant development, but track it like, when do plants start coming up? You just got, in Roslyn, you just, you just got snow today. So it may be a little while. Plants here in Nelson are just starting to come, right? So learn the timing of, of, of plants and track it because with climate change, it's, it's could change too. And the plants will tell you that the climate is changing. That's kind of an interesting um, personal research experiment. Visit other people's yards and projects in your own region. Okay, so learn your yard, right? This is educating yourself like water. Where does it come from? If it's snow, how long does it stick around? Um, where does it go? How long does it stay, right? Start thinking about this. Start a journal like, okay, where's the yard come into my, you know, does it stick around and this, this is wetter than that? This is really droughty over here, right? Start mapping out your yard. Sunlight, so where does it come from, right? And it's gonna change throughout the year, keep that in mind. And does your house block it on one side, right? That can affect what plants can grow on the north side of the house versus the south side of the house, for example. How long does it last? What blocks or enhances sunlight or heat? Um, enhancing sunlight and heat in Roslyn might be a pretty good idea. So, you know, think about that. It's not always bad. Right, soil conditions, right? Do you have, what is your soil composition like, right? Does your soils hold moisture or shed moisture? Um, and again, that's gonna change throughout the year, right, as well. Um, and people like in Roslyn or if you're in trail or in other places, often those soils have changed in the, in the past. So you might wanna get a soil, you know, get your soil tested and find out actually what you're, what you're dealing with. Are you actually dealing with, your parent soils or was there fill brought in to put in your subdivision or, or your house or, or something like that. Like, you know, think about um, what soils you're working with. Okay, so as promised, the Kootenai Gallery of Art, um, thrilled to be a part of this. So Olga um, invited me to uh, consult on this project and we started in uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, various partners, community support, um, and funding. Uh, it is a registered Monarch Way Station, um, and Kootenai Native Plant Society before that started that process, and Olga finished it. Um, and so in fall 2020 and spring 2021, so two years ago and just earlier last year, uh, we enhanced the butterfly garden. That's what this looks like right here. We solarized a very large piece in behind that garden. You can see it right back here. And we sheet mulched a future flowering hedgerow, which I'm gonna describe in a moment. So hold on to that thought. I'm really excited because with CKIS, which is our Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society, um, I've applied, or the Kootenai Gallery has applied for funding to make this our region's first native plant demonstration garden. And that's really exciting. So to get signs here, interpretive signs, do in educational workshops, have a place right at the Kootenai Gallery. So thinking about like bringing art outside, right? And, and creating these beautiful artistic spaces that are ecologically um, healthy and resilient and bringing in pollinators is, is really quite thrilling. All right, so in the fall of last year, we seeded um, this beautiful future butterfly. That's where the little pink fairies were coming up. 
um, augmented or increased the diversity in our butterfly garden right here. Uh, this is just a back slope. We threw on some transplanted plants and, and some, some shrubs. And this here in a fence, just mostly to keep the elk and deer out, um, is our, our uh, it's going to be a, a horseshoe shaped flowering hedgerow um, with an entrance right over here. So I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment, but a little bit more, just in case you don't know sheep mulching or what uh, Olga loves calling um, <clears throat> lasagna layering. It's a great way to build soil. It's also a really, really great way to kill grass. So starting with existing soil, I like to start with um, carbon materials that are perhaps you know human made constructed so start with cardboard start with paper and then go on to more natural um products like fall leaves straw that sort of thing compost top, topsoil and then mulch on top to help retain soil moisture and keep those weedy species out if you're not planting like you're going to see coming up um, on the, the photos i'm going to show you if you don't plant until fall, leave out the compost, leave out the topsoil, do all the other layers, but leave out those. Those are only gonna encourage plants to grow. You don't want plants to grow yet until you put the plants in in the fall. And so, but you can kickstart it early because that way you're starting to kill the grasses and everything underneath and then starting to incorporate those soil organisms up into these organic materials, building soils, getting it ready. So when you put those plants in, should be ready to go. Okay, so thank you, Olga, for sending over these photos. So we started the sheet mulching with overlapping cardboard, two layers. Um, and I have to say for you folks in Roslyn, you need someone like Olga because she put the word out on Facebook, all the stuff that I don't do. And we got more than enough materials. We were giving them away, take home to people. It was great. Overlapping cardboard to start. And then look at this, how much fun we're having. On top of the cardboard bags, these bags and bags of shredded paper. The Castle Gar News, if you ever wanted to know what to do with extra Castle Gar News or Roslyn News or newspapers, that's a good use. Layer in each water well. Okay. And then we put our leaves on top. And then we just happen to have burlap coffee bags from the organic roasters. And if you can get your hands on those, they work like a hot dam. Um, so those went on top. And then finally, some mulch because we weren't going to plant until the fall. So that's what it looked like. A nice, beautiful sheet mulch site in June last year. And then we planted it in the fall. So away we go. And uh, so that was fun. So when we planted, we pulled off the mulch, left everything in layers. Put the soil had actually a dump truck back right up dump right on and then we shaped it the way we wanted it into our horseshoe shape and whatnot did our planting and then mulch goes back on walk away for the uh for the winter so that's the sheet mulching process quite fun this is what i wanted to show you so this is our front yard this area here, actually the whole large yard was grass, just like this back here, the whole thing, sloping grass. And so this area was sheet mulch, which is cardboard and mulch. That's it for three years. This is what I have now. I pulled it back and I said, oh my God, there's no, this was lawn three years ago, right? And it's beautiful soil. I'm gonna put it in my beds. I'm gonna use it. Right, it just takes a little bit of time, really. Like three years, okay. Um, but now, you know, now it's it's soil, right? Look at how beautiful it can be, right? In a couple of years, and if you have the patience, you can do well. You don't have to dig up your lawn. You can plant on top of it, sheet mulch it. You can solarize it, and you can use it, and it becomes soil, and that's awesome. Okay, some perennial native species. Silver leaf phacelia, our friend B. taxonomist Lincoln Best says this is best for bees. 
And he says, like, if there's a top 10 list of plants that you should get in your garden, you number one is silverleaf phacelia. And number two, and number three, and number four, number five. Okay, little joke. However, this one over here, round leaf alum root, um, this is a, we had it in a pot for a while. It grows beautifully in a pot, by the way. So all of you who have smaller spaces, um, it's now out of a pot, but this plant attracts bumblebees like nobody's business, right? All in all. So these two plants, if you put any two plants in your yard, these would be awesome. They're both white flowering. So you might want some colors, some pink berries or whatnot, but those are good ones. Yarrow, um, it's also a cure-all, beautiful ethnobotanical plant. Um, yarrow is a great one to get in your, in your yard. Um, native lupin, the silky lupins are the ones that for us that occur at lower elevations. Kaylee, I believe I gave you the large leaf lupins, which is a higher elevation, better for Roslyn. Um, some seeds for that for Sunday. Um, but yeah, native lupins are awesome. And this one, so like brown-eyed Susan, you've probably heard of black-eyed Susan, right? So you can have brown-eyed Susan in your garden and it's great and it grows so well and it attracts lots and lots of bees. So annual species, perennial species, some like brown-eyed Susan take a couple of years to flower, um, but some, you know, will flower in the first year. So, and they're perennial. So see what you can do, start small, play with it a little bit, and then explore, right? That means seek more opportunities, learn more, try on new things, make mistakes, consider building different types of habitat, connect with local biodiversity around you. That could be within your city or outside your city or different cities. Like there's lots of going on in the West Kootenai. Why not, why can't we like connect region or city to city, region to region? Try and make mistakes, let the plants tell you or teach you what you need to know. I love this, embrace messy. Like ecology is messy, beautifully so, right? get some messy in your life, right? Now the city might not like it because I don't clean up my yard in the fall. I clean it up in the spring. And at that time, I'm still kind of like, oh, should I be doing this? But your messy is someone else's home. So just keep that in mind. And that's what you tell the city when they come by and wonder why you haven't cleaned up your flower beds yet. So... But, uh, you know, there could be bees nesting in those combs of those grasses or those plants. There could be insects, all kinds of organisms using that plant material. So consider that you're sharing your home with others' homes as well. Monitor, right? Keep the journal, monitor, see what's happening. Uh, ponder, don't lose your sense of wonder. Um, and most importantly, have fun. All right, I wanted to let you know about this cool uh, little experiment um, that we're doing with our friend Janet uh, just outside of Nelson. So this is a hedgerow planted in 2018. How are we doing? Stay with me, Kaylee. We're getting through this. Um, okay, planted in 2018. You can see we put in cuttings, small transplanted plants, small potted plants, um, and 2020, this is what it looked like. And in 2021, it looked like that. I can't wait to see what it looks like this year. And multiple species. And so this is where I kind of wanted to bring to light sort of, this is like what native plants like to teach us. In the first year, when you put them in, they like to sleep because they're trying to figure it out. They've just been transplanted into a new location. They don't really know if they like it or not, but they're gonna give it a try or they won't, right? The second year, they creep. They're starting to establish their roots. They're starting to figure out, okay, I got some room here. All right, I can do this, I can do this, or they'll give it up, right? And then they sort of, throw their elbows out at some of the other plants, like give, I need more room. But this is what happens after year three, the leap, right? So sleep, creep, leap. That's what it does. And it's so if you can hang on for three years, then you're gonna get something really exciting out of it. This is in our yard. Again, I just, I really wanna be inspirational for y'all there in Roslyn. So 
Um, this little section of uh, the yard was planted in 20, um, actually in 2019. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2021. And what I wanted to point out is that it was planted with young, young plants in 2019. There are 10 species in three square meters. You can do a lot in a habitat patch, right? In a little space, you can plant habitat. And it's great. I got, see, this is the silverleaf facilia. This is shrubby penstemon. I got some onions in there. I got, oh, this is the round leaf alum root. And right here, this is a beautiful nooker rose. I planted that from a cutting, right? So you can do cuttings too. Um, you got to get the seeds in there for genetic variability, but you can do some cuttings too. Why not? And just the other day, when Mel, who I mentioned earlier, came to pick up the seeds for you all in Roslyn for Sunday, I dug up some runners of the rose and gave them to her, right? Plants that keep on giving. I don't want them. They're going out of my little three meter spot here. So, but someone else can use them, right? Isn't that great? I think so. So woody plants, we talked about annuals, we talked about perennials and some woody plants. Some don't have to be very big. Also back in that habit patch, right? I had some white meadow sweet. It's about, you know, pretty big. Um, this is the shrubby penstemon. Gorgeous, bumblebees love it. They come and pollinate, listen to them. Um, some plants, uh, some shrubs are, are bigger, right? Most are. Uh, mock orange is good, especially for you all that live in bear country. Um, but if you got bears anyway, you might want to get some choke cherry in there, which definitely will draw bears in. But choke cherry, when it's in flower, super important for pollinators, for native pollinators, um, as all of these plants are. And I need to bring your attention because right now the willows are coming out and we kind of dismiss them. They're not big and showy and, you know, they have these catkins and we don't really know what to do with them, but the pollinators do. So in the next week or so, go down to whatever elevation you need to be at. I highly recommend going out to Beaver Creek and check out the willows because they are going to be all abuzz with native bees. All right. Share, last one, help to foster an enthusiastic community. So this is really for you folks in Roslyn or wherever you live, right? You need to have support and you need to um, support each other, right? So share what you've learned, share resources, all your new skills and your labor and seeds and plants, right? You can collect seeds from your own plants that you put in your yard and expand your own garden spaces, share with other people. Continue to make observations, keep a journal, keep reflecting on what you're learning, right? Always keep on learning and learn along with your, your new yard and, and, and figure out what's going on and in your community, right? And support each other because there isn't a lot of us out there. And so we all need to connect to one another and form this, this great committee community where we can share um, resources and expertise. So just a couple of things, a word about seeds, they're beautiful. And you think the plants themselves are different and unique and special, the seeds are equally so, right? So when you start collecting your own seeds, you're gonna be, holy cow, these are beautiful. They're gorgeous, right? And they're very, very different and they have different requirements. Some, like I said, some cold moist stratification. We do that by planting in the fall and letting nature do it over winter, or you can mimic, mimic it in the fridge, for example. Some need, like these shrubs need to be cleaned, right? And some take a long time to germinate, right? So you need to figure out how to deal with the seeds that you collect. Don't just collect them and not do anything with them or not know what to do with them. So kind of need to, to learn a little bit more about that. And then when it comes to seeding, drop them in a bucket of sand and then bring your friends and, and uh, sow a, a meadow together. It's really quite fun. A word about 
sharing resources, right? So the Kootenai Native Plant Society has quite a few resources available. I can highly recommend the Xerces, Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They have a lot of really useful tools, resources online. Uh, KinSeed, our own seeds, um, information, uh, plants. And then, of course, the CKS Eco Garden um, project is also another local project here in the West Kootenai or in the in the Kootenays that you might want to look into. And I can can't recommend it enough. Think about starting a community nursery. It does not a lot, right? You here's one of our project partners in a project I'm about to talk about, um, describing all the great things that he's growing from the seeds he's collecting. Um, this was a project, um, a workshop, communities making meadows. We did several years ago, I believe. Kaylee, that's where we first met you. But starting your own nursery, collecting your own seeds, learning about plants in that way is really rewarding. Um, and beneficial for everybody. It's a win-win. So the last project I wanted to tell you about tonight is, it's a Wildflowers for Pollinators. This was a three-year project that we did with the Kootenai Native Plant Society, where we help people create pollinator meadows all up and down Kootenai Lake. And we developed a Kootenai Lake seed library so people can come and take seeds out free um, they can collect seeds, contribute to the library, and we had uh, wild seed collecting workshops and really help people connect with the region where they live, but also learn and build competence in how to create a meadow on their own home properties. All of them started out with some kind of solarization. Some worked better than others, that's true. Some were in an old farm um, field, this was a, a gap in a forest. This one here is an old garden. And this is a new build um, up in Kaslo. So I wanna focus on this one because Leah, and if you're on this, Leah, I still bow to you. Um, Leah's got amazing meadow making skills. So this is north of Kaslo. So this is a new build in 2019. You can see gravelly, rocky, sandy, like what is gonna go on there, right? I want you to know that if some of you are adverse to this plastic stuff, the plastic that was used here is exactly the plastic we used at the Kootenai Gallery, right? So it can be reused, right? She donated it over and then, right? So it's been used several times over, now it's in the landfill, but, but it was used several times. Um, but check this out, in 2020, so Leah really embraced the, the whole bees approach, right? She started, she contacted us, she wanted to be a part of this project, and then she learned. She went on seed collection workshops, she read everything, she emailed us plant, random plant questions, which we love, um, right? She really, and she started collecting her own seeds, and this is the result, right? And check this out, this was last year. And she just kept learning. And most of the people in this photo are her friends. And now she's sharing her knowledge and plants and her seeds and they're sharing. And it's, they're building a real community in Caslow um, and the region. And, and she's got a beautiful meadow that was really just kind of a gravel slope a few years ago. So as you can see, there's more for her to do, but she's well on her way. There's great biodiversity happening right in her front yard. So perennials that keep on giving, I just have a few slides left. I just wanted to say, go back to this idea of invasiveness. So these are the plants that do keep on giving. They produce copious amounts of seeds. Some keep runners out. Um, fireweed, as you know, likes to blow around on the air currents, but purely everlasting, and a lot of the asters do too. And so once you have them in the yard, you're gonna have them in your yard. And so you might wanna think about a border, a boulevard, a property that borders up against a natural area, places where you can just let them do their thing. But one of the things that I want to bring your attention to is that these plants are so great at making more of themselves, right? That opportunistic, aggressive, I mean, goldenrod in our yard is just an all right, outright bully, really, right? But that said, they attract bees, butterflies, flies, beetles, bugs, hummingbirds, right? They attract all these things. So there's a reason, there's that co-evolution working in place, right? 
all these plants just blooming their hearts out, making more of themselves, attracting more pollinators to make more plants. And then they're also attracting the pollinators to pollinate, to pollinate all the other plants in your yard, right? So it's worth it, right? Just find the right place for them. That's all. <laughs> they can be bullies. Okay, so bringing the bees to Roslyn and a little schematic, and I'm just about done. So this is really how Roslyn, I think, can start blurring the fences that metaphor of those boundaries that we might have around conventional gardening, right? So the idea is to begin, right? So yard, right? It's all good. Choose a patch, whatever size it could be. Could be little, could be big. Just start, right? Put some plants in there. Get some plants from Kaylee on Sunday, on, you know, your Earth Day event. Get some plants in there. The pollinators will come, you know, plant it, and they will come and it will work. Trust me, if you get the plants in there and they flower, you will have pollinators, right? So that's how you start, right? Then you start educating yourself and you expand it out and you say, hey, that person down the street's doing the same thing. Oh, over at the museum, hey, hey, you're doing that too. What have you found out? What have you learned, right? What resources do you have? Oh, let's call Brenda. Let's see what's going on. Um, or let's, hey, let's take a rundown to the Kootenai Gallery. What's happening down there? right? Educate yourself, connect, right? And then start exploring, right? Those bees will find those other patches, right? If you start expanding a little bit, start incorporating more species into your gardens a little bit, that meant that augmentation, right? Building those species, building those connections, then you'll start seeing that happen throughout Roslyn or throughout your home community. community it will happen. Connectivity is what that's called, right? And then that's when you start sharing. And then this is where it gets messy and gets fun, right? So sharing resources, sharing labor, sharing your interests, but sharing your enthusiasm and your plants and your seeds. And then that's when it starts cooking. I mean, this could be, you know, here's Kaylee's yard over here and here's the museum and, and here's Mel's place. And then up here's Eva's place. And then, right? And then you start connecting to one another and it can really work. Um, and it can work well and Roslyn can put itself on, on the map, I think, to, to be a, a native plant um, hub for, for the West Kootenai for sure. Um, so just a little schematic there of how I think it can work uh, bringing the bees approach to Roslyn. And so native plants, they're unique, they're beautiful, they're inspirational. Many of them you'll never have in your yard. Many of them shouldn't be in your yard. Some of them are extremely rare. Some of them are really common, right? But for, first and foremost, start, explore and educate yourselves, share that enthusiasm, your knowledge with everyone else. Um, and most of, most, you know, have that light a fire of native plant conservation. Right now we have, in general, native plant blindness, right? We, we look out there, we see something we call landscape or habitat, right? It's just what happens outside the city. But let's start seeing the species for who they are, right? And, and seeing them for the virtues that they have and the connections and honor those connections that have been in place for thousands of years and help foster them moving forward, right? And really take on native plant conservation and participate in, in local restoration projects. And then together as a, as a community, then we can do a lot to mitigate climate, uh, fire smart um, our communities, uh, share native plants with one another and, and really build a, a community that is really grounded in good conservation. Um, thank you very much, and I appreciate you taking the time and letting me run over till eight o'clock. Um, here's a, just a few more uh, resources for you all. Um, for you that are local, we'll have a, a spring plant sale in mid-June, and we'll, as always, have our fall plant sale in October. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much for, for your talk. We're getting some questions rolling in. If people are posting questions in the chat box, please 
uh, address them to everyone so everyone can can see. And if you'd like to ask Bren a question, put your hand up and then I can find you and unmute you so you can you can ask the question in your own words. That would be great. <clears throat> We have a couple questions already. We had one earlier from Almeida about why we would do, why are we hedgerowing? Is it to marry the cultivation, like cultivation with wild? What's the intention of the, the hedgerow? Ah, I love the hedgerow, right? So think about all those cedar hedges that you have seen in the, in the world. Um, so a hedgerow is just, it's, it's a way of bringing in a, an unmanicured hedge, if you will, but hedgerows often can have multiple species. They can serve multiple um, goals. Uh, hedgerows in Britain or in other places in the US or Europe um, can be um, sound barriers, they can be sight barriers, they could be fences. Um, they could be all different kinds of things, but they could also be places for harvesting. Um, I did an edible hedgerow for a farm to fork um, place on Vancouver Island that, you know, put in a hedgerow um, to harvest for, for the restaurant. Um, and so, yeah, it could have multiple values, but it, it's a great way. So I also like to think of a hedgerow as a vertical meadow. So think about it that way. Um, not all meadows are wildflower meadows that are perfectly horizontal. Some meadows can be, you know, flowering uh, wildflowers and, and meadows can be vertical as well. And that's what I see a hedgerow to be. So we, we have a question coming in from Selena. Hello, I just had a really quick question. Um, I'm visiting here from Calgary, but I would love to take this sort of um, approach to gardening back mm -hmm. to my city to have natural plants in my garden and help the ecosystem. Yep. Um, do you have any resources um, that I'd be able to contact so I'm able to, um, that people just specialize in, in that region? There is, and I got a call on, see if I can get Valerie in here. Um, what is the name of my partner in crime here? Hi there. Um, Google wild about flowers. Um, Arden is an amazing native plant grower just yep. outside of the city of Calgary. So uh, that's who I would recommend. Yep. Thanks. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I knew she'd know. Arden. On, on the topic of seeds and where to get seeds, do you, do you have any recommendations about collecting wild seed? Say you're out on a hike, what do, you, what do you tell people about that? What do we tell people? Well, first and foremost, um, if you're gonna collect seed, know what you're collecting, right? And there are ethical guidelines um, around seed collection. Um, we tell people, you know, first and foremost, don't, you know, don't take more than 10% of a population at any particular time, right, from any particular plant, right? Make sure your uh, population that you're harvesting from is not on private land. Uh, if you do, get permission, obviously. Um, but if you are, make sure the population's healthy as well. You don't want to take from a roadside population that looks stressed out. You, those plants need all the help they can get just getting their own seeds in, out. Um, so yeah, make sure the population is healthy. Make sure you're 100% know what you're, you're harvesting. Don't harvest more than you're actually going to use um, and never ever take more than 10% of any, of any plant at any one time. We have a question, th thanks Bren for that. We have a question from Rossland Arts Council. Kaylee? Yep. It's oh, hi. This is so ridiculous. It's actually Susan Ports. Oh, hi, Susan. I um I logged on with my with the, the incorrect Gmail. So I'm I'm looking as though I'm Ross Arts Council, but I'm actually just Susan Ports. <laughs> um anyway, I was wondering about the hedgerows 
I know that uh, hawthorn is a very popular plant for using a hedgerows in the, the in Great Britain. I just wonder, are hawthorn plants native to North America and are those a good choice? Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the hawthorn because our native black hawthorn is uh, one of my favorites, um, even though it has long spikes. Um, yeah, we do have um, Crataegus de glaciae. We have a native black hawthorn uh, here in the Kootenays. It's a beautiful, beautiful shrub. Uh, and if you want to create an impenetrable fence, definitely put in a hedgerow of black hawthorn. Thank you. Yeah, that was actually but my experience with it. I, I was actually thinking, um, I used to actually live where Kaylee lives now, and we had horses there. And I was thinking it'd be so much better to use yeah. a, hedge, a hedgerow instead of a fence. You know, mm -hmm. and something impenetrable like that would be great. I think it probably would also be good for keeping, you know, bears and deer out of some areas. Mm -hmm. okay, is it fairly? Is it fairly wet? Uh, there, uh, in the place where I'm thinking about putting it now, it's yeah. not that wet. No. Okay. Yeah, it might you might have it a little tough to establish. It does like it a little bit. It likes to wetter feet so probably mulch it heavy um yeah. if, if you do yeah and see it yeah see how it goes but i definitely would highly recommend um hawthorn yep okay thank you very much you bet we have a question from andrew coming in and andrew if you can unmute your your microphone Oh, hi. I, I submitted a, a, a written question, so didn't expect to um, <laughs> to talk. But uh, basically, uh, I had a question about horsetails, which are okay. native, but are sometimes troublesome. So mm -hmm. do you have tips on how to control those? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you. I don't know. If, yeah, in that one shot of Leah's meadow, uh, that's yeah. She's she's got a lot of horsetail in there. They are native, so um, you know you you could you could sheep mulch them and start over on top. That's often what I recommend for like people who have um, other perhaps not as um, welcomed. Uh, invasives like hawkweed, um, you often just kind of want to sheet mulch it and then kind of start on top and then hope it just becomes incorporated and not sneak out the sides. The horsetail tends to do that. Um, I would A, either learn to live with it. Um, I think Leah in her garden is looking to outcompete it, and that could be another way of going with horsetail. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There was a, a question about solarization and sheet mulching. Would you do those two things together? No. Different applications. Yeah. So, so, you, so, I mean, if you have the wherewithal, like the excavator or whatever, yeah, you can, or if you have labor, um, you can tear it up, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to do either one. However, Solarization, if you have the time, it works well to kill what's on with minimal additional labor prior to seeding. Um, and yeah, it, it involves clear poly, but maybe that can be used somewhere else. And you could do it in multiple sizes, right? I think there was a question about size. You could do um, 10 square meters or you could do 50 square meters. Um, Sheet mulching works if you want to plant right away, right? So you create those layers, you can plant right away. Or like we did at the Kootenai Gallery, you can layer it up, let it work its magic, killing what's ever underneath, and then plant into it. So it's really about building soil. Just like good organic farming, it's just, it's always about making sure you have good soil. And just another question um, or a comment, I would not actually add fertilizer as well. I, I would, if you're gonna do, do a whole sort of complement fertilizer, like a, a manure, well-composted manure or a compost when you do your planting, um, 
But I mean, think about it this way. Our native plants, at least in the Kootenays, are used to more or less more acidic, more infertile soils. So they do fairly well with less. If you add a lot of fertilizers to the mix, you're only going to encourage introduced species that will outcompete your young native species that are trying to get established. So think about a balance there. If anyone has any last questions, let me know. Some people's browsers are not, uh, it's not, if your browser's old, unfortunately talking is not supported on this platform, but you can still type your question. And I wanted to say something about the workshop on Sunday. We do have a few spots left. You can email me, my email is in the chat. And if you can't come to the workshop and you do live in Rossland or within very close to Rossland, we, we have a bunch of seeds. So if you're not able to come Sunday, but you would like to, to start experimenting with some native plants, please send me an email and, and we'll find a time to give you some seed for your own garden that we got from, from Bren and Val at Kin Seed. So we're, we're very excited to start experimenting with that. And I'm sure everyone after listening to your talk tonight is gonna to be inspired to go and, and start working on, on these projects. And so we'll have to, take pictures and and keep a journal so that we can share our progress with you over yeah. the next couple of years maybe in three years it would be a good goal to to really exponentially increase the number of native plants in Rossland that'd be great and so we I have everyone's emails on this call maybe we can share some of the resources that that you shared with us tonight in a follow-up email and that way if you have any other projects, there was one question actually about whether you're giving any other workshops or uh, if there are other ways people could get involved with your work if, if they had some time. They can feel free to contact me um, on the last slide or I'll send it out again via email. Hey, Kaylee. Um, and there's opportunities to get involved with the Kootenai Native Plant Society as well. In terms of for Kinseed and for me, the next workshop that I'm going to give is with Thimble Hill Nursery. Um, and that'll be in September about getting uh, native plants into the garden in the fall. Uh, so look for that. That website was also on the last slide. So maybe we can get that out as well. Um, I also wanted to bring uh, a note to everybody. So if you get on the website for the Kootenai Native Plant Society, which is kootenainativeplants.ca, um, we're having uh, an AGM next Tuesday night. Um, from six to eight. So that is a good time to see what's going on with the Kootenai Native Plant Society next Tuesday at six. That sounds like a great opportunity. So if anyone here has some time that they'd like to share to volunteer for the Kootenai Native Plant Society, go to the AGM and figure out how you can help out. I have one last question in the chat box and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for our Earth Day talk tonight. Right. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, the last question is whether there are any threatened species that you're currently working on cultivating to try and boost their local populations. Oh, um, in terms of plants, um, we are working with many plants like milkweed and whatnot to boost endangered um, or climate resilient um, or climate vulnerable butterflies. Um, however, in terms of, of plants, yeah, there's one plant that's actually fairly common that grows in the pond array, um, but not really elsewhere called um, purple meadow rue. Um, it's a big, beautiful six, seven foot meadow rue uh, native um, that is rare that we're looking to, to do more with. Um, we're dealing, we're doing a, a really sweet little project. Um, this is part of the Bummers project um, over in the East Kootenai. Um, there's only two known resident breeding populations of the rare blue listed silver spotted skipper. Um, and it needs a native plant called uh, wild licorice. Yes, there is a wild licorice, which is kind of neat. Um, and it occurs quite commonly over in uh, the East Kootenai. So in the Bummers flats where we're working is 
uh, one of the locations, the breeding locations um, of this, of the skipper blue listed and the wild licorice, which is also blue listed, but they need each other. And so we're looking to get more of that out there. Fun fact, in the West Kootenai, we had, well, we have wild licorice, but it's a lot rarer, but we have silver spotted skipper. But thanks to mining companies and the like, what we have is a lot of black locusts introduced. Some would say invasive. The silver spotted skippers have switched over to using an introduced invasive species. Think about that next time you're taking out an invasive species. There could be a rare species that depends on it. Well, on that note, that's good <laughs> food for thought. Thank you so much for, for, for chatting tonight. And I am looking forward to seeing where everyone takes this project. I, I look forward to seeing where y'all take it too. Yeah. Have a great Earth Day tomorrow. And um, well, I guess every day it could be Earth Day when you do the work you do. Yeah, I like to think so. Thank you everybody for taking time out on your Thursday evening to, to spend it with us. And yeah, I wish I could have seen you all, but uh, I too. appreciate you being out there. And thank you again, Kaylee. Okay, see you soon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>